It is the late 19th century, Christmas Day. A young child proceeds to the, the dining hall to receive his Christmas gift, the Lambeth Workhouse, workshop, workhouse. These are mostly young men, young boys who have no parents or the parents are not responsible for them at the moment and they're wards of the state momentarily. One of those small children is Charlie Chaplin. This scene plays again and again throughout the book, in my mind, Charlie Chaplin versus America, when art, sex, and politics collided. Scott Iman is the author. I welcome Scott now. This scene, Scott, I return again and again to it in your careful analysis of Charlie Chaplin's spectacular career. He tells the story, I imagine, more than once. He also uses the image of oranges on Christmas to his own children when they are uh, not appreciative of the wealth that they grew up in. What happened to Charlie Chaplin? I imagine he was some six, seven, eight years old. What happened to Charlie Chaplin that day? Good day to you, Scott. Good day to you, John. Thanks for having me. Uh, the story the story was told to me by uh, Chaplin's son, Sidney. Uh, Sidney Chaplin was named after Chaplin's brother, Sidney, uh, for very good reasons that we can get into later. Uh, Sidney Chaplin told me that uh, he would go over to his father's house in Switzerland for Christmas, and the tree would be 15 feet tall and hundreds of presents under it, because they Chaplin and his wife Una had eight children at that point as well as Sydney coming over from California to spend with uh, time with them over the holiday. And he said, you could set your watch by it. At some point uh, on Christmas day, Chaplin would grow very quiet while the kids were plowing through their presents and running around and everything. And, and then he would say, when I was a boy, all I got for Christmas was an orange. And Sydney had been listening to this uh, sentence for, and at this point, Sydney's 30 years old. Uh, Sydney had been listening to this sentence for basically all of his life on Christmas Day. So one Christmas, he got up the nerve to say, well, Pop, I live in California. I could bring you all the oranges you want. And Chaplin shot him a look <laughs> that clearly indicated this was no laughing matter and he didn't appreciate the humor. Uh, it related to something that happened to Chaplin when he was uh, domiciled uh, in uh, the Lambeth workhouse as a child. He would have been, as you said, seven or so. Uh, his father uh, had died of alcoholism at the age of 37. His mother was uh, currently in and out of asylums uh, for what clearly seems to us to be a profound schizophrenia. She also was syphilitic. We don't know whether the syphilis, uh, the, the, the schizophrenia was a function of tertiary syphilis or whether it was simply uh, another problem that she had. We'll never know at this point. But she was clearly emotionally and mentally uh, profoundly unstable. So Charlie uh, and his brother were remanded to the tender mercies of a Victorian uh, workhouse. Uh, and it was, on the one hand, it was basically the only uh, real education he ever had. He had the equivalent of a fourth or fifth grade education. Uh, so that's on the plus side. On the other hand, it was profoundly humiliating for him. Uh, he got ringworm, his head had to be shaved. Uh, he was laughed at by the other children. He was small. He was extraordinarily shy. Um, not hard to imagine why. Uh, he didn't mingle well with the others. Not hard to imagine why. And at Christmas, the gift that they got, each child got an orange. That was it. And this haunted Chaplin all of his long 88 years of life, uh, the ch his childhood. Uh, and he regarded basically, I think, his entire adulthood and maturity as uh, a successful escape from his childhood. Because that one Christmas, he'd done something irregular and he didn't get an orange and he talked about weeping. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and when he returned to Britain as a success, he went to the Lambeth workhouse and pointed out his seat where he sat weeping. Now, I, I start with that story, Scott. Your book is so overwhelmingly convincing about the genius of Charlie Chaplin at the same time, the tragedy of Charlie Chaplin. And I think it's all in that story. You need to meet his mother, Anna Hill. As you say, she struggled with what might have been syphilis, 
might have been mental illness to begin with. She was a bootmaker's son. I'm following your reporting. And she married Charlie Chaplin Sr., who was theater. She was theater too. At one on point, she- level, on a lower level than her husband. Uh, her Charles Chaplin Sr. was quite successful uh, for a brief period of time before uh, the, he was overwhelmed in a sea of alcohol. Uh, but he toured America. Uh, he made a decent living for a time. Uh, but the 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 music hall vaudeville atmosphere environment in in uh, England was quite different from the vaudeville atmosphere in America. Uh, in England, the performers were expected to drink with the customers after their performance. They were supposed to mingle and get the uh, the audience to to buy drinks and increase the profit margin of the theater. Uh, this naturally enough. Uh, lured more than a few performers in in England to uh, towards alcoholism. In America, uh, it was quite the reverse. Uh, entrepreneurs like the Schuberts and, and B.F. Keith uh, uh, basically forbade the, uh, the performers to mingle with the uh, audience and didn't require them to drink with uh, their uh, uh, customers. So there was a far lower re- uh, percentage of alcoholics among American vaudevillians than there was among English vaudevillians. But Chaplin's father uh, uh, succumbed quite young to uh, to the disease. Charlie Chaplin was born April of 19, of 1888. And in 1903, his brother returns from sea, Sid, his older half-brother, although they looked alike, older half-brother returns from sea, uh, sea and takes charge of Charlie when he's told mother went insane again and she's in the hospital. Charlie remembers his mother as a dainty woman with violet blue, violet blue eyes and long hair. He idolized her in his memory. Is that is that fair to say, Scott? Absolutely. He adored her. Uh, uh, he, he never really saw her. He did see her out of control. He did see her frantic. He did see her in a semi-deranged state. But it never really impacted his positive memories of her, of how she would uh, uh, her long brown hair and the way she she doted on him really uh, and and took very good care of him when she was able to when she was emotionally stable at those times and those were the times he focused on um, yes he he loved his mother very much he didn't yeah, but- really care for his father but he didn't know his father very well because his father disappeared from his life when he was a small child right and there was a, a younger stepbrother born and another relationship that Hannah had, but I want to focus on Sid now. Sid takes charge of Charlie. They were in and out of orphanages or workhouses together, and then Sid went to sea. Sid comes back in 1903, and he's going to take care of Charlie by introducing him into the theater. Did Sid know theater, this man, Fred Carno? How did he How did he get Charlie and signed up with him? Everybody knew Fred Carno in uh, uh, early 20th century London. Uh, Fred Carno was the rough equivalent of Max Sennett in America. He, I see. He, he produced comedy on an industrial scale and, and promoted it throughout the English uh, Isle and actually into the continent as well. Uh, the Carno companies were so successful, they even toured America and were quite successful in America. Sid preceded Charlie into the Carno company. Sid initially was going to, didn't know what he wanted to do. But after being at sea for a while, he realized he didn't want to be there. Uh, and he thought, well, he might as well follow the family tradition and become a performer. So he got a job as a comedian with Carno. And after a time, by this time, Charlie is uh, b- 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 about 20, 19 or 20. Uh, he got Charlie a job. Also, now Charlie had had some theatrical experience before, but nothing on the level of working for Fred Carno, which was on a fairly high level. Uh, but he got Charlie a job, even though Carno thought it was uh, not a good idea because Charlie was tiny. He was five foot six uh, and scared and looked much younger than he actually was. He looked like he was about 14. Uh, but he took him on because Sid had been successful and Carno liked Sid. So he felt he was doing Sid a favor. As it turned out, Sid had talent and Charlie had genius. And within a very short time, Charlie was one of the premier comedians in the Carno company. And uh, at that point, basically, their days of want were over because they both made a decent living in vaudeville. Not a huge living, but they weren't poverty stricken anymore and they weren't going to be poverty stricken anymore. 
Uh, we're going, we're, we're, let's go to America, Scott. Sure. Scott Iman, Iman's book is Charlie Chaplin versus America. When art, sex, and politics collided, Charlie Chaplin arrives in America with the Carnot Group. Uh, my, day, my notes say 1910 to 1913. At first, America overwhelms him. He comes to New York and the, the vaudeville halls, but, a, but he comes to love it and travels with the burlesque, the vaudeville, including the Marx Brothers and Stan Laurel is mentioned. Stan Laurel knew Charlie in London at the time. This is the Laurel and Hardy. Yeah. What did he make of him? What was his opinion of the young Charlie Chaplin? Uh, Laurel thought Chaplin was prodigiously talented uh, and studied him carefully on stage. He thought Chaplin was strange as a human being. He wasn't like the other vaudevillians. He didn't mingle particularly with the other vaudevillians. He didn't go out, uh, you know, scouting around for girls uh, after the show. He'd, he'd stick around and read books. And his professional habits were bizarre. You know, you're supposed to be there a half hour before curtain if you're a performer. And Chaplin wouldn't be there. And it'd be five minutes before curtain. And everybody's panic. Where's Charlie? Charlie's not here. And Charlie was the star of the show by this time. And Laurel was Chaplin's understudy. So they tell him to get his makeup on and get ready to go on. At which point Chaplin would breeze in a few minutes before curtain, slap his makeup on, take his position. The curtain would rise and Chaplin would slay the audience reliably. And this drove Laurel crazy because A, he didn't get a chance to perform. <laughs> and it was also vaguely unprofessional. But what I take from that story, which was a recurring thing on the Carnot Company, is that Chaplin had absolutely 100% self-confidence in his professional abilities, even as a young man. Uh, he wasn't nervous about performing. He didn't have stage fright. Uh, he knew he could control the audience and, and do his job and make the audience laugh. And he didn't have to sweat it, in, in other words. Whereas a lot of performers, perhaps most performers, have terrible stage fright and they're nervous and they use the, the, that nervousness to uh, uh, to point themselves up for a performance. Chaplin wasn't nervous. He didn't need to be nervous to point himself up for a performance. He had absolute self professional self-confidence at a very young age. And it accelerates. This is a time when America's going from the vaudeville or less cows to movie houses in New York and out of California. So we go immediately to 1914, an important date, of course, because that's the outbreak of the catastrophe in Europe. But it's also the beginning of Charlie's rise in motion pictures. And it's astonishing how quickly he earns a million dollars a year and controls his own pictures. He writes Sid a wonderful letter. Oh, Sid, you're not going to believe this. Who is this? What is the Senate company at the time? Max Sennett was, had, had been in business for a few years at this point in Edendale, California, uh, the Keystone uh, Company. He, uh, he made comedies. He made rough slapstick comedies. And because he was making uh, two single real comedies a week, sometimes double real comedies a week, uh, it was a lot of output. So he needed fresh uh, uh, talent all the time because the industry at this point, the movie industry in Hollywood, is expanding exponentially almost on a monthly basis. So there's a great deal of new companies being formed. A lot of hiring is going on. So a lot of people are leaving uh, the Keystone Company as well as coming in. And Ch and Senate had seen Chaplin, uh, his stage act, with the Carnot Company. And he thought he was very funny. Chaplin's uh, 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 act, basically, he was, a, he was a comic drunk. That was what he did on stage for Carnot. Uh, and he was made up to look 40 or 50 years old. Uh, and when it... And, and, and they, they negotiated back and forth for a while. And finally, uh, Chaplin agreed to come work for him for $175 a week, which is very good money in 1914. Uh, and when he got to the Edendale and he met Senate, Senate was appalled because Chaplin was uh, 24 years old and looked about 17. <laughs> and he was also rather handsome. He didn't look funny at all. He, he, he didn't look like a comedian. He looked like a young leading man. So Senate said, well, this isn't going to work at all. Uh, you need to do something about your, 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 your we need to do something about your, your appearance. So he told uh, Chaplin that he would have to uh, come up with a makeup, some kind of comic makeup. And basically in the space of about an hour, Chaplin went into the wardrobe department and put together the costume that became world famous as the Tramp. Uh, the pants were from Fatty Arbuckle. Uh, the, uh, the derby was from somebody else. Uh, and he thought, well, if the pants are too big, 
then what about a, a, a coat that's too tight? He wanted contradictions. So he used a, a waistcoat that was very tight and big slap shoes uh, and a cane for uh, uh, for punctuation, for comic punctuation. And he put the costume together very quickly and he started making movies uh, very quickly. And within several months, uh, it was clear that the movies were becoming extremely popular. There was demand for more Chaplin, more Chaplin. And at that point, Chaplin began demanding to direct his own pictures, which which took Senate aback because Chaplin had only been in the movies for three or four months at this point. And here Chaplin was demanding uh, control. Uh, but the, uh, the the financials were were clearly on Chaplin's side. They were selling a lot of tickets to Chaplin movies. So and Chaplin offered to put his salary in escrow. And if the film was a flop or couldn't be released, then he'd pay for it out of out of his salary. Well, Senate couldn't turn that down. So under that agreement, uh, he made his he directed his first one or two films and they were extremely successful. So from that point on, Chaplin never worked for any other director. And the trap is born putting two things together now. His memory of Hannah Hill, his mom, whom he couldn't rescue, and that costume that he puts on for Max Sennett. We're watching a comic, a genius comic, take pieces of his life. Because as I read from you, Scott, all of his performances were autobiographical. The character was autobiographical. The only time he had a fail, failed to be successful in a movie was when he left that character, the autobiographical character. Later on in life, Charlie said, I was part a character out of Dickens and part a symbol out of Shakespeare. That's how he saw himself. Now, quickly, he marries Mildred Harris in 1915. He marries uh, Lita Gray in 1924, both unsuccessful marriages. He'd been pursuing women, young women, all the time. It was part of being a star in those days, a very ordinary what he was up to. We have about a minute here. Uh, it was ordinary, but it was, he was extraordinarily shy. There's a wonderful story from Groucho Marx in the book that Groucho Marx told. They were friends in vaudeville. And the Marx, they were in Salt Lake City, and Chaplin was leaving Salt Lake City after his booking, and the Marx brothers were coming in, and the Marx brothers invited him to go to a whorehouse with them. And uh, Chaplin said, well, okay. And they got to the whorehouse and the Marx Brothers took the, chose their girls and went in the back. And Chaplin didn't. Chaplin stayed in the lobby all, all night playing with the dog of the madam. Uh, he was too shy to take a girl into the back. And Groucho Marx thought this was completely indicative of his character. And Chaplin was extraordinarily shy. But when Chaplin became world famous, that ameliorated the shyness uh, to a great extent because he didn't have to approach people. People approached him, including women. Uh, and he also uh, got over some of his shyness and he was able to approach women in a way that he never had been before. So between those two factors of, of, of people uh, approaching him and wanting to meet him and all that, as well as his own growing self-confidence, he became much more comfortable with women, which would in inevitably cause him a great deal of, the, of the discomfort and, and, and trouble. The book is Charlie Chaplin versus America. Scott Iman is the author. Charlie Chaplin is a hugely successful Hollywood star. It's the 1920s. He's been twice married, and then he makes a movie with Paulette Goddard and falls in love with her, though I learned from Scott there's no marriage license to be ever found, but they're married. That's the third marriage. And Charlie Chaplin has concepts that he picks up in a world tour in 31 to 32. I believe Paulette Goddard went along with him. And that becomes the movie Modern Times. Scott, what did Charlie see about the world with Paul at Goddard? And I believe there was one or more trips to Bali. What, what did he make of it? Uh, Goddard was not with him on that tour. That was He, he met her right after he came back from the tour. Uh, what he saw was uh, the worldwide depression. He'd only, even in uh, the midst of the, of the depression in America, Hollywood function. Uh, I mean, the times were tough. Uh, you had two movie studios basically go into Chapter 11, Paramount and RKO, but people were still working. Uh, it was not uh, uh, it was not bread lines and, and, and soup kitchens as it was in New York City or Chicago, for instance. So the people that lived in Hollywood were sort of insulated from the worst aspects of the Depression. But when Chaplin took an 18 month tour around the world in 1931, 32, uh, he saw the worst aspects of, of, of the Depression, and he was absolutely stunned and appalled. 
it transcended even his own experiences in Victorian London because he saw what he saw was hopelessness in a way that he hadn't seen in Victorian London because the English are, are you know, bustle about uh, even at their worst. They, they, they tend to be optimistic. But what he saw was squalor and depression, uh, and a human depression, not just financial depression. And it really kind of focused him on social inequity in a way that nothing had before because he hadn't been out of the country since 1921. He'd been working steadily from 1921 to 1931. So it was his first vacation uh, in 10 years, essentially. And it was a revelatory experience. He wrote a, a book about it, about his world tour, which focused a lot on economics, uh, which became a fascination of his and, and he pursued for a number of years. Uh, and it also focused, uh, focused him on what could be done to help people uh, when government and business had both failed the populations. Uh, which is what led to essentially him him making modern times, which I think is probably the film of his that uh, the late film of his that survives the best for modern audiences. Yes, uh, modern times is again a series of social commentary. That's the way I'm going to say it generally. The scenes on the production line are vivid. Everybody has seen them, but the Accidental picking up the red flag. That's brilliant, Scott. What okay. did it what did it mean to the audience at the time? Because we need now to meet the allegations against Charlie Chaplin as a communist. Well, the FBI had opened a file on him. The predecessor of the FBI had opened a file on Chaplin in 1922 because he'd been attending some socialist meetings in Los Angeles with a friend of his named Rob Wagner, who was a socialist. Uh and they'd opened a file on him, which went nowhere. They it, 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 they just opened the file and mentioned that he was attending these meetings. And he was not a fan of Will Hayes, uh, who had been a, a cabinet member in the Harding administration and had somehow gotten uh, uh, lucky and was hired to run the Motion Picture Association of America, uh, and thereby avoiding the uh, uh, astonishing range of scandals of the Harding administration. Uh, and this was noted in the FBI file. Uh, and then basically the FBI file goes blank for a number of years, and, uh, and but picks up again in, in the late 1930s with the release of Modern Times and with Chaplin's plans to make The Great Dictator. Uh, it was the, the business with the red flag in Modern Times was his way of, I think, acknowledging that he was regarded by people who maybe weren't really serious politically uh, as uh, uh, becoming dangerously radicalized. And he's pointing out that uh, there, there was poppycock, that uh, he was a very wealthy man by the 1930s, extremely wealthy man by the 1930s. He hadn't been hurt by the Depression because his brother, Sidney, had told him to get out of the stock market several months before the market crashed in October of 1929. So uh, he didn't get damaged at all. Uh, the idea of, of a man as wealthy as Charlie Chaplin, who owned his own studio, financed his own films, and had an extremely conservative uh, stock portfolio, which I enumerated in the, in the book, being uh, a dangerous radical was ludicrous on the face of it. And that was his way of, of creating a sight gag to point it out how ludicrous it was. Modern Times, his female lead is Paulette Goddard. And Paulette Goddard is easy to like in the movies, and your your book made me like her more. Orson Welles, she had a cash register for a brain. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, they they were together for ten years. They were never married. Uh, they told people they were married. People yeah, they claimed they were married in China. That was the way they beat the uh, gossip, I guess. Yeah, but no, they were never married. There is no marriage license. They went through a sham Mexican divorce, even though the lawyer, Chaplin's lawyer, who was handling the Mexican divorce. Asked, asked Chaplin's other lawyer in Los Angeles, uh, since there's no marriage certificate, what exact, why are we doing this exactly? <laughs> they were doing it. They were getting the divorce to give here, to give Paulette plausible deniability that in fact they had been married because if they hadn't been married, why did they get a divorce? Uh, because they felt, she felt that uh, if they just came out and said, well, we were just shacked up or just living together, it could negatively impact her career. Chaplin didn't care if uh, he, he, he was completely indifferent uh, to matters like this, but he went through with it for Paulette's sake because she had by, by this time had a burgeoning uh, a career at Paramount Pictures 
And uh, he went through with the uh, sham divorce basically to uh, give her some protective coloration. Yes, I learned from you that Paulette Goddard was almost Scarlett O'Hara. I didn't know this. She was I... choice number two uh, behind Vivian Lee. And and the problem was uh, there was a, there was some discomfort amongst the gen the, the choice of of uh, who's going to play Scarlett O'Hara was a big deal in 1938. Uh, because everybody knew Selznick had bought the screen rights and he was testing dozens of actresses and it became a real, uh, the testing of the actresses and who's going to get the part became a topic of uh, kind of general, general, general conversation. Uh, and Goddard was living with Chaplin at his house. Uh, and whether or not they were common law marriage, was a common law marriage, I never actually checked out what constant, how many years they had to be together to constitute common law marriage, but they were living together as man and wife. So he ended up going with Vivian Lee, who was a better choice because Vivian Lee's a better actress. But what he what was not generally known at the time were, uh, was the fact that Vivian Lee was living with Laurence Olivier, <laughs> whose divorce hadn't come through yet, nor had her divorce come through yet. They were also living in sin in Hollywood. Hollywood. Um, Hollywood. Nobody, but it wasn't generally known that Vivian Lee was living with Laurence Olivier, whereas it was generally known that Paula Goddard was living with Chaplin. So that was one of the mitigating factors that provoked David Selznick to hire Levitian Lee. The great dictator. This is the transition from silent to speaking. And Charlie Chaplin was hesitant to have the tramp speak. In fact, the tramp never speaks. But there are two roles here played by Charlie Chaplin and the great dictator. One is Hinkle, the dictator. The other is the barber, who has just a few lines. Now, striking to me, I always guessed at this, but until I read your research, I didn't know. Chaplin and Hitler looked alike and were perceived as looking alike. Did Hitler imitate Charlie's mustache? Do we know? We don't know that. We don't know that. It's a strange mustache to imitate. Uh, you wouldn't think uh, that, it, that it, it would be, a, it, it would be a, a, an attractive choice, uh, but it is the identical mustache. Uh, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, it's very strange. The Great Dictator is a huge risk. Is this one that UA didn't want to distribute and Hart Charlie had to put up money? I, I can't remember. Was well, that money? Charlie, Charlie financed all of his own pictures after 1918. Uh, he didn't accept any outside money because he believed that if he accepted outside money, he'd have to listen to somebody giving him their opinion about his script or the film or what they, how they wanted to release it, and he simply wouldn't countenance such interference. Uh, he, he, he insisted on absolute autonomy, and the only way to uh, maintain absolute autonomy was to use his own money. So all of his feature pictures, The Kid, The Gold Rush, uh, City Lights, Modern Times, The Great Dictator, all of them, he self-financed. Uh, even when he made City Lights and Modern Times in the 1930s after sound had rolled in, and uh, talky pic talking pictures were ubiquitous. Uh, and he was the sole holdout in making silent movies. And he basically, the reason was he wasn't ready to give up the tramp and he didn't think the tramp could talk, period. Because if as soon as the tramp opened his mouth and said a sentence, the tramp was English because Chaplin had a soft English accent. Even though he'd been living in America since uh, 1913, he still had a soft English accent. And thereby, he would limit the character's universality. And he believed in the character's universality. He believed that was part of the attraction of the character, that he was accepted uh, as German in Germany, as French in France, as English in England. Actually, the character is English. He's, he's very much an English construct. Uh, and he was American in America. So why would he give that up just to be au courant and make a sound picture? So he only gives up silent pictures when he makes the decision to stop playing the tramp after modern times. And even though he costumes the Jewish barber in The Great Dictator to look like the tramp, I mean, he's got the waistcoat and the baggy pants and the derby. The Jewish barber is much more passive a character than the tramp ever was. The tramp is uh, uh, always standing up for himself and for other people and uh, kicking cops in the butt and running, and running away, and and creating havoc if he has to, in order to 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 foment his independence and the independence of those he loves. The Jewish barber is much less is much more passive, uh, so there is an alteration in the character. 
I don't know that he actually thought of the Jewish barber as identical to the tramp. I'm inclined to doubt it. But costuming the character in the same uh, clothes as the tramp, I think, was his way of, of making a gesture to the audience that he hadn't completely rejected the character. The book is Charlie Chaplin versus America, When Art, Sex, and Politics Collided. Charlie's a great success with the great dictator. He makes a speech. Joseph Davies, the ambassador to the Soviet Union, cannot attend an event in San Francisco during the Second War. And Second Front is the big story. Stalin wants a Second Front open. Eventually it will be, that's Normandy, 1944. But the push for the Second Front was widespread. The Soviets at this point are counterattacking the Germans, they're hard pressed. The US is keeping the Soviets in the field with Lend-Lease, but Charlie's asked to step in for Joseph Davies in San Francisco and makes a Charlie Chaplin speech, all for the Second Front. That incident will become important because of what is about to happen to Charlie with his libertarian, libertine understanding of the world. A young woman named Joan Berry, that's her one of her pseudonyms, comes crashing at his door one Christmas. I believe it's 41, Scott, I get lost 42, here. 1942. 42, and she has a pistol. Who is Joan Berry? Joan Berry had been the mistress of J. Paul Getty in uh, uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, she thought it would be fun to be in the movies. Uh, she got a letter of introduction uh, that she could use generally. She traveled to California, met a number of movie people, including Chaplin. One thing led to another. His relationship with Paula Goddard was over. They had broken up. He was uh, between pictures at this point. The Great Dictator had been a huge hit. And as Chaplin would note, he was only vulnerable to, shall we say, recreational sex when he wasn't working. When he was working, it was 24-7, uh, and he was all in on the project, and he really was a nose-to-the-grindstone guy, to um, continue with the cliches. And he wasn't really interested in women or girls. Between pictures, when he had no project, that was when his attention would, would, would wander, and he was between pictures at this point. And he met Barry at a Hollywood restaurant. They had dinner together. Uh, one thing led to another and they became a couple. It lasted about a year, start to finish. Uh, she, they would break up. She, was, she began to show signs of emotional distress. Uh, she would go away, then come back to California, uh, back to his house, go away, come back. Finally, she left to go uh, see uh, 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 back to Oklahoma to see Getty. She came back sometime later, uh, Christmas 1942, and uh, announced she was pregnant. And he and Chaplin was the father. Chaplin did the math and realized he could not possibly be the father. He also refused to settle. Why did she have a pistol that time? That was that came a little bit later. They, a, a month or so later, they went back and forth for a while. She was uh, growing increasingly irrational. And on Christmas, two days before Christmas in 1942, she showed up at Chaplin's house, broke a window, let herself in the house. Uh, and they uh, 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 held him at gunpoint. And it, it, was, it, was, it was a really, really bizarre episode. Uh, that even in Chaplin's telling, juxtaposed with her telling, seems to be uh, uh, completely 90 miles an hour around hairpin curves. Uh, it's hard to imagine that he would possibly put himself in a position with a, a woman wielding a gun. December but, 23rd, 1942, that's the day. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, he refused to uh, settle. She went to head a Hopper and told him that she told Hopper that she was pregnant and that Chaplin was the father. Uh, Hopper went to other gossip columnists, gave them the news. The FBI found out and the FBI sailed into the case as well. Chaplin, a few months later, Chaplin was indicted under the Mann Act. The Mann Act was uh, a kind of obsolete law that had been passed around the turn of the century uh, preventing men from transporting women across state lines for immoral purposes. It was meant to stamp out prostitution. Uh, but they prosecuted him on the Mann Act for transporting her across state lines because at one point when he'd gone to New York to deliver a speech about the Second Front, 
she had uh, 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 followed him and they'd been staying in the same hotel. Uh, and they, they prosecuted him on the Mann Act because of that. Uh, he was acquitted of the Mann Act after the jury uh, deliberated for an hour. Um, then came the uh, paternity suit. By this time, the uh, hue and cry amongst the columnists was in full full flower. Uh, a week didn't go by where Hopper or Ed Sullivan or Westbrook Pegler weren't writing uh, uh, anti chaplain stories, basically branding him a roué, a libertine, uh, dangerous to the moral uh, uh, ecology of America, you name it. Uh, he took a willingly took a blood test. Uh, the blood test proved he was not the father of the child who had been born in the intervening months before the uh, paternity suit went to trial. The blood test proved he was not the father and the jury found against him anyway. At this point in California, a blood test was not dispositive. The jury could overrule the blood, uh, results of the blood test if they so believed, which is what they did. Chaplin appealed. His appeal was denied. So for the next 18 years, he had to uh, uh, pay uh, support for a child that wasn't his. And Joan Barry goes on to have a very sad life, dying quietly in 2007, having married and had two other additional children to Carol Ann. At some point, she writes a letter, I believe in the early 1950s, writes a letter to Charlie Chaplin's attorney saying, Carol Ann, the child, is not Charlie Chaplin. She tried to, she tried to make it right, but it was yeah. too late. She backtracked. She completely backtracked. Said basically that the FBI had fomented the paternity suit and nudged her into uh, uh, prosecuting Chaplin. Uh, whether that's true or not, is there's no way of telling because she was so unstable. She spent 10 years in a California mental institution uh, in the 1950s, between, in the late 1940s into the 50s. Uh, so there's no telling whether she was lying then right. or whether she was lying later. You know, she could one at what she was lying at one of those points, but we don't know which. Uh, but 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 basically, later on, she blamed the FBI for for fomenting the case. Well, that considering what came later might very well have been the case. Yeah, we're, we're the ready. Evidence. We're ready to join in that blame. <laughs> Scott Hyman is the author of Charlie Chaplin versus America: When Art, Sex, and Politics Collided. The Second War is over. The catastrophe has happened. There are tens of millions of dead. There are war crimes tribunals in Europe, and then war crimes tribunals in Japan. And Hollywood, like everywhere else in America, institutions trying to go back to work with the returning soldiers. Charlie Chaplin's going back to work. He's world famous and he wants to make movies. He's got his own studio and he has plenty of money, lots of money, although he's still haunted by the poverty of his childhood. He can no longer be the tramp. He needs to deal with speaking pictures and in this instance, he comes across a plot, a story idea given to him or suggested to him by Orson Welles. It will eventually be called Monsieur Verdot, French name, but it was in Orson Welles' mind as a serial killer, a bluebeard called Lady Killer. Scott, this is a wonderful story to introduce Orson Welles. Orson Welles' idea, what was it based on and how do they see it as comedy? Good evening to you. Thanks, John. Uh, Wells uh, uh, came to Chaplin a few months after Citizen Kane opened with this idea. It was an idea that Wells wanted to direct and use Chaplin as the star to play uh, a character based on Landru, who was a famous French serial killer who murdered uh, a succession of, of wives, of his wives. Uh, well known in France, not very well known here at all. Uh, Chaplin told Wells that uh, he appreciated the offer, but he didn't work for anybody else uh, except himself. But he liked the idea and he wanted to buy it from Wells. So he bought the idea for $5,000 from Wells. Uh, the interesting thing is Wells and Chaplin never really liked each other, <laughs> which and I, I, I suspect the reason was because there wasn't enough room on Everest for two egos that size. Uh, they both had uh, uh, outsized uh, uh, egos and, and both of were used to being autonomous and neither one of them was used to collaborating meaningfully with anybody else. An Orson Welles movie is an Orson Welles movie. 
you can tell it's an Orson Welles movie in 30 seconds. The same thing with Chaplin. Uh, they had to work by them. They had to work alone. They had to work alone. But Chaplin paid Welles $5,000 for the idea. Uh, and he waited. Uh, this was before the uh, Joan Barry incident happened. After the Joan Barry incident happened, he had married uh, Una O'Neill, the daughter of Eugene O'Neill. And they began their family. Uh, they eventually had eight children together and, and stayed together for the rest of Chaplin's life. Uh, and he began shooting uh, Monsieur Verdoux in 1946. It came out in 1947 and promptly presented him with the uh, only flop, only, only only a professional flop he had as a filmmaker, really, until his very last film in, in 1967. Uh, it was the critics hated it, by and large. The public ignored it. By and large, it didn't do business anywhere in America. It did okay in Europe. It did much better in Europe, but it would. Um, uh, it, it's a cold-blooded movie about a serial killer, uh, which is not what people after World War II in America wanted to watch. Uh, it was the wrong movie for the wrong audience at the wrong time, and uh, it left Chaplin uh, with uh, a considerable degree of uh, bruised feelings. Uh, because he felt it was a good picture. He felt he'd offered his audience something different than what they expected, perhaps too different in in, in retrospect, he would think that, uh, and he thought uh, maybe he'd made a mistake in 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 his treatment that he, you could you could convince people with laughter more than you can with drama. And he thought maybe he'd erred on the side of not having it, uh, enough humor in the picture. But it was on him. He always, he always took responsibility because if, if the audience doesn't respond, it's on me, he would say. And he, a, 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 a reporter asked him once, well, you don't say that about books. He said, books are aimed at the intellect. Movies are aimed at the emotions. And if I fail to, if I fail to reach an audience's emotion, that's on me. Uh, so in, in time, he basically took responsibility for, for Monsieur Rideau himself. Thanks. And it, at the time, in 1947, it was a deep, deep wound. Uh, thanks to your book, I saw v Monsieur Verdot for the first time. You guided me to it. And I follow Aldous Huxley's comment, it's a mess. But it's a mess that happened simultaneously. And I ask you for the linkage. Simultaneously with the House on american Activities Committee, I, lining up to call or to speak to or to identify Charlie Chaplin as a risk to America. Is that because the book, the movie was a flop and he was for the first time ever, no longer a success, no longer a big hero? Or was it, what was it going to happen anyway? They were going after all the major stars. They were going after the, the, the Un-American Activities Committee initially focused on communists and former communists. It was easy for them because they, the FBI had by this time informers within the communist party in America and they had the membership roster. So they could look at the membership roster for Los Angeles and, and see who had been a member and who was a former member. And those were the people that constituted the Hollywood 10. Every member of the Hollywood 10 either was a currently a member of the party or had been a member of the party and quit. Uh, so they were all basically uh, guilty as charged. So they had no, no place to hide. By after the Hollywood 10 hearing, the, the, the net began to broaden to include, I guess, what you could call apostates, uh, to include nonconformists, uh, to include people who never had been members of the Communist Party. Uh, and that definitely included Chaplin, who had been investigated by, by 1948-49. Chaplin's house had been surveilled. His, his mail had been opened. His, uh, uh, his uh, studio, his taxes had been audited, both corporate and personal. His uh, employees at the studio at the Chaplin studio had been interviewed and the FBI knew definitively that he was not a member of the party, had never been a member of the party, had never donated money to the party. And they still wanted him, wanted his hide because he was, he'd made Monsieur Verdoux. He was, he had a, uh, a, a difficult sex life, shall we say, a uh, flamboyant sex life, shall we say, uh, which outraged J. Edgar Hoover, no end. Uh, and a lot of other people uh, who, who counted themselves in the same a circle as J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, and they wanted Chaplin. They wanted him out. And they couldn't get him on the conventional way of getting him out, which was to find that he'd been a communist because Chaplin had not been a communist and was not, in fact, a communist. 
I don't even think he was a fellow traveler. Did um, he know they were after him? Did he know they'd been tracking his bank accounts, tapping his phones, watching his house? I don't know how he couldn't have. I don't know how he couldn't have known. Uh, he might not have known that his that his phone was tapped. That's possible that he didn't know that. But he certainly knew he was being surveilled. Did HUAC surveilled. know that FBI had been harassing him for, what is it now, 20 years? Uh, sure they did. Sure they did. They had access to the files. They had access to the FBI files. Uh, so and, and they had intended to call him in 1947 as part of the uh, uh, initial House on american Activities Committee. But it was it, that was canceled. Finally, they never did call him because they knew he hadn't been a member of the party. And that would gum up their narrative that they were constructing at that point, where everybody they called had been a member of the party or was currently a member of the party by bringing Chaplin in, who was not a communist and never had been a communist. That would spoil the narrative. So they decided not to call him. So, but the propaganda campaign a campaign against Chaplin continued to pace as uh, 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 he was a citizen. He'd never been a citizen. This was used to hammer him over and over again. He had retained his British citizenship, uh, his relationships with women, uh, his uh, his dangerous anti-fascism and making the great dictator, uh, his insufficient patriotism about American industry in modern times. All these inferential things were 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 were, were thrown into a kind of political gumbo that was used to assault him uh, for for years at a time almost on a weekly uh, and certainly a monthly basis. Somebody was always writing an anti, a negative Chaplin piece uh, in, in, in the popular press uh, from basically 1942 through 1953, 1954. This so is a wonderful time. It was cumulative character assassination. About Hedda Hopper. What was, what was her opinion of Charlie Chaplin that she stayed on him like a stalker for, for decades? Why? She thought he was a great actor. She uh, she thought he was politically dangerous. And it was, there was a personal issue as well. Uh, Hedda Hopper had been married to a man named DeWolf Hopper. DeWolf Hopper was famous for his recit recitation of Casey at the Bat in Vaudeville. That was all he was known for. Uh, he was elderly. He was about 30 years older than Hedda Hopper. He had been married four or five times previously. Uh, the marriage broke up. He basically dumped her without any support, uh, leaving her with her son, William Hopper, who became Paul Drake on the Perry Mason TV show. So she projected her loathing of her ex-husband uh, onto Chaplin because she took him to be uh, uh, the same kind of louche character that her her ex-husband, DeWolf Hopper, had been. So it, he checked off all of Hedda Hopper's boxes, you might say, emotional boxes. While this is going on, Charlie's going to make a movie that is a recapitulation of his life, Limelight, when we come back. Scott Iman is the author, Charlie Chaplin versus America, When Art, Sex, and Politics Collided. HUAC, the FBI, eventually the Truman administration pursuing Charlie Chaplin, but he's got a studio at La Brea and Sunset in L.A., and he's making a movie that will be called Limelight. It's a brilliant piece of construction having to do with his life. It's based on a story that he writes up as a novel, Calvero. What's in the novel? You've studied it, I haven't, Scott. What's in there that he makes a movie out of? Because you can't use everything in a novel. No, basically, a, a lot of it is not, it's, he never even put it in the screenplay. A lot of the novel was never even put in the screenplay. It was, it's, it's a very atmospheric memoir slash novel about the Edwardian theater as Chaplin found it as a young man uh, and what the life like and what was life, life was like, what the, the, the bars were like, what the backstage life in the theaters was like. It's very rich and very nostalgic. And I think what he was trying to do was immerse himself in his memories by constructing a fictional narrative, which he then took and transposed by cutting a lot of the atmosphere and sticking with the plot but injecting as much atmosphere as he could get into the screenplay uh, because he's recapitulating his life. He's in a sense, recapitulating his father's life. Uh, it's the story of, a, of an old music hall comic who became an alcoholic and drank his career away. Well, that's not Chaplin. That's his father, you know, uh, but on this, on the same token, by the same token, it's also, he also injects his compulsive narrative about saving a helpless young woman, which is, 
recurs over and over again in his films, uh, whether it's it's the kid or or the gold rush or the circus city lights, modern times. They're all about the tramp rescuing a helpless young woman. In this way, he's able to process his grief over being unable to save his mother. You know, he, he couldn't save her in, in his life because she was too far gone and he was a child. But in by fictionally recreating it with uh, him, him as being an activist adult, he could save this 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 attractive, loving, loving young woman that he'd love so much uh, as a child. So it's a, it's a way of putting his own conscience to rest, I think, over and over again. And this is the last time he tells that story in limelight of 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 an older of, of, a, of a settled man with issues saving a young girl who's on the verge of falling apart. And he discovers Claire Bloom, who remembers him. Oh, 70 years later, she has a, a, admiring things to say about how he worked with her. She, uh, she adored working with him. He treated her beautifully. Uh, he, 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 he thought she was uh, extraordinary uh, because he, could, he had trouble casting the part. He said he saw every young ingenue in Los Angeles, including Marilyn Monroe. Uh, and he couldn't find he couldn't find the actress because he basically wanted the actress to play a cross between Una, his wife and his mother. And that was a high bar, you know, uh, and Bloom looks a lot like Una. In fact, there's one shot in the film where Una doubles for Bloom because he did a retake and Claire Bloom had gone back to London in the interim. So he had Una do it and she just put her hair in front of her face so you can't see her face. But Una does double for Claire Bloom in one shot of the film. Uh, but it's a it's a conflation of of all these emotional currents that have been running in, through Chaplin's life for 60 years since he was a child. He does have one detail that's not in the novel, I believe, that is genius. He brings on Buster Keaton. Why? Well, it, the character does not exist in the novel. The character does not exist in the screenplay. Uh, Keaton was a choice that happened during production and the, the emotional centerpiece of the ending of the film was going to be the ballet. He always was going to have the ballet. Uh, but and there was this sequence where Calvero is a benefit for Calvero and he doesn't act. And he thought, well, maybe I should, the Calvero should have an assistant. And well, who do I get? And so he began talking with some of the people working on the film and somebody suggested Buster Keaton. Uh, who was doing a lot of work on television at the time. Now, Chaplin didn't watch television. He hated television. And he didn't watch it. So he didn't know that Keaton was sober because he'd been an alcoholic for years. He didn't know Keaton had sobered up. And he didn't know that Keaton was working in television. And on the spur of the moment, Chaplin said, well, pay him $1,000 for a week's, for a couple of days' work. Let's bring him in. So they brought Keaton in. And actually, it, it involved several weeks of work between devising the routine rehearsing the routine and shooting the routine it, it took longer than it was supposed to but keaton was absolutely on on point chaplin's on point they worked together on an equivalent level uh i mean chaplin was the director it was his money but they worked the routine out between the two of them like two professional comedians would you do this if you do this that'll be funny and then i do that and that'll be even funnier and then you do that and it was about back and forth and it was a joy to watch them put the routine together uh, on an improvisational basis and shoot it. Uh, and it was a great experience for Keaton. And it was a great experience for Chapa. And Keaton later said, because his agent thought $1,000 was too cheap. And Keaton said, I would do it for free for Charlie. I would work for Charlie for free. Limelight is the title of the movie. And I recommend everyone to watch the whole thing, but especially the Keaton part. It's like two superheroes, Scott. <laughs> it's camera, right. On camera together, with more than a hundred years of experience in Hollywood between them, and we still remember them vividly. We're going to turn now to the limelight success and Charlie Chaplin's decision with Una and their children to travel to London for the opening of Limelight. And therein lies the crisis. Scott Iman is the author, Charlie Chaplin versus America, When Art, Sex, and Politics Collided. I recommend the book, I picked it up. I didn't know anything. Now I don't know anything. Plus, I know what Scott has guided me to learn more about, which is early Hollywood, when 
Men and women invented an art form that dominates the solar system and will forever. The idea of telling a magical story on a stage that moves. We're going now to a success of Limelight and Charlie Chaplin's decision with his growing family and his, and his devoted wife, Una. They're going to travel to London and Europe in order to enjoy the opening of Limelight in London and then tour some with his young family, including Geraldine Chaplin, who will become a movie star on her own once in the future. We're, we're looking at, though, uh, days when you needed an, um, a visa to come back to the country after leaving it. And in order to, uh, in order to get that, you had to apply for the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS. It's important now to establish that this wouldn't have been the first occasion that Charlie rushed up against the INS. Remember, the FBI has been tracking him since 22 with nothing. Hedda Hopper and Ed Sullivan, whom I will never celebrate again, have been hectoring him for decades for unknown reasons of their own, perhaps their own personalities, but for no evidence whatsoever that Charlie Chaplin did anything wrong. However, at one point, I believe it's April of 48, a man named Boyd at the INS interviews Charlie Chaplin, and the INS is now part of the decision-making. The idea is, if Charlie Chaplin leaves, we won't let him come back. Whose idea was it, Scott? Who came up with this genius smear? Uh, it appears to have been James McGranery, the attorney general, Harry Truman's attorney general, as a matter of fact. Uh, McGranery was an ardent Catholic, and he he was deeply offended by Chaplin's uh, 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 relationships with women. Uh, the chaplain's uh, uh, marriage was marriage to Una was uh, completely stable and basically a, a, a model of monogamy uh, was of, of little import to uh, uh, McGranery because he was still judging Chaplin uh, by the, uh, the scandalous uh, uh, treatment of uh, that had been dealt with in the press over the Joan Barry case and uh, one or two of his marriages. Uh, Chaplin and Una and their four children, they had eight total, but they only had four at this point, 1952. It's September of 1952. They're on the Queen Elizabeth sailing to London. One day out of New York, they got a wire that his reentry permit had been revoked pending an investigation. Uh, and that he would have to reply, uh, that, it, that he would have to reapply for a reentry permit if he chose to come back. Well, what he didn't know was that about a week after the uh, reentry permit was revoked, there was a meeting at the INS. And basically they came to the decision that if he came back, they were going to have to let him back in the country because he'd never been convicted of anything, not a misdemeanor, not a felony, nothing. No, he'd never broken the law as far as the federal government was concerned. Uh, but Chaplin didn't know that. In any case, Chaplin's back was up. He was enraged. At, uh, at being kicked out of his adopted country, which is something he never would have left on his own. He was he had just spent a serious amount of money expanding his house on Summit Drive uh, because of all the children he and Una were having. He needed to uh, enlarge the house, which he certainly had just done about eight months previously, which he wouldn't have done if he was planning on, on, on bailing. So he clearly was was here for the duration, but the uh, the revocation forced him into deciding what to do with the rest of his life. If he wasn't going to live in California, how would he get his films out? How would he get his money out, his stocks and bonds? Everything he owned was in America. Uh, and where would he live? So these were a huge number of, of balls that he had to juggle in the air. Uh, he worked very fast. This happened in September of 1952. Uh, in less than six months, he bought uh, a manor house in Switzerland where he lived for the rest of his life. Uh, and uh, Una had gone back to America. She had been born here, so she was a citizen. And she closed out his accounts and his bank accounts. His brother, Sidney, came to the rescue uh, and moved from Florida to Los Angeles to close out the studio and to handle all the hardware at the studio and, and whatever else Una could not take care of because she only came back for about a week to take care of the financial aspects of the Chaplin estate. Uh, so Sydney basically hung around for several years, uh, uh, liquidating the rest of it. Um, and it was Sydney's suggestion, actually, that Chaplin consider Switzerland. Chaplin initially thought, well, maybe London, maybe England. But I don't think 
he really wanted to go back and immerse himself in all those memories that England had for him. You know, I think Switzerland, uh, there were obvious tax advantages, which were of uh, considerable importance to Sydney. Sydney spent most of his life uh, devising wild schemes to avoid paying income tax. Uh, and Charlie was not uh, uh, terribly well disposed towards paying uh, uh, income tax either, although he always paid uh, everything he owed to uh, the U.S. government, certainly. Uh, the, all, the, all the audits he had to endure proved that. Uh, so he decided to settle in Switzerland. He also needed to lower the temperature. I mean, he would endured a lot uh, since 1942, uh, since the, uh, the, the, the Russian speeches, the Joan Barry thing, the Sheer Verdue. He needed to lower the temperature, and Switzerland's a good place to lower the temperature. Because uh, there's not a lot to do in Switzerland. You know, you, the seasons come, the seasons go, uh, the snow mounts up in the winter. Uh, it's very quiet. It's very restful. It's also a little dull. Uh, and the flip side to moving to Switzerland was he kind of began to drift, I think, in a creative manner, uh, creatively. He was not, he was no longer forced to be on point like you are in New York, like you are in London or Paris or Madrid or Los Angeles for that matter, you know, where it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, 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 an environment that demands you pay attention to what's going on around you. If only to cross the street <laughs> in Switzerland, you don't have to worry about things like that. You can just relax. And Chaplin was, uh, cosseted by his, his money, his estate, uh, raising his, his, his children. He had a lot of other things to do finally. So he kind of settled back into, a quasi uh, retirement that involved only two more movies for the rest of his life, which was another tw uh, 25 years. And uh, he wrote a very good memoir, uh, which I commend to uh, anybody that's listening, if you haven't already read it, uh, and uh, enjoyed his estate and enjoyed his children and enjoyed his marriage. Uh, I want to speak of the two movies because it, the movies are evidence of what you say that he he lost the inspiration that he found in California and in America. Yes, yes. Or the little tramp. The first is the king in America. King in New York. King in New, king York. In New York, which struck me as a bad idea right away. Yeah. Uh, and I I found a clip of it. I, 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 I haven't seen the movie. It's ghastly. It's, I, I wonder what's going on here. Where Where is he going with this? He made it to the Shepperton studio and that might be an explanation. He, it wasn't his place. So he, he was a guest and that must have upset him because he had to follow other people's rules. That incident you tell about the unions and moving the chair, what happened, Scott? Uh, yeah, he was, he was used, uh, he, he had built his own studio in 1918 and all of his films after 1918 had been made at the Chaplin Studio on La Brea, which is now the home of the Jim Henson Company. The, it was a delightful statue of Kermit the Frog dressed as the tramp mounted on the chimney very charming uh and everything he'd done so that he would he he was master of his domain to use jerry seinfeld's uh, uh phrase uh it was a little kingdom uh he was comfortable there it was homey it was a city block small studio but perfect for his needs and when he wasn't working it would he would rent it out to you know to independent companies that wanted to shoot there uh so it was it was it was like a second home for him and losing both his actual home on Summit Drive and his second home, the studio, uh, I think uh, it left him a little at sea, almost literally at sea. He didn't feel comfortable working uh, at other studios. And during the production of King of New York, he had uh, he was blocking a scene with some actors and he picked up a chair and moved it. And they promptly called a strike. <laughs> the crew promptly went on strike because the director is not allowed to move props. You know, only 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 the grips are allowed to move props and they called a strike. And he, and now Chaplin was uh, a politically liberal, but he said the, they're going to kill the goose that lays the golden age eggs if, they, if they're going to go on strike because a director moves a chair. He just thought that was manifestly insane. But he didn't know about uh, English unions, which were very, very strong at that point. Uh, he had no concept of things like that. So he was a little taken aback by by things like that, because he hadn't had to worry about things like that in Los Angeles at the Chaplin studio. That, that took me to the workhouse, Scott, took me to the workhouse and what he said repeatedly through his life, he cannot abide authority telling him what he has to do. No, no, he had to have absolute autonomy. 
all of his life after uh, uh, the Carno Company is essentially building walls to guarantee his own autonomy. Uh, uh, whether it was founding United or co-founding United Artists in 1920, building his own studio in 1918, financing his own films, uh, he 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 answered to no one, no one, and suddenly he has to you know search for distribution for the two films he made in in uh, in, in Europe uh, had to be disconcerting for him and uncomfortable for him because the cost of making movies had in, was increasing in the 1950s and 60s past the point where he felt comfortable financing them himself. It's simply King of New York, he financed himself for a B movie budget. He spent less money, much less money on that than he spent on limelight uh, because he was getting nervous. But, and, and so it looks, it, it looks like it's a film that isn't really thought out and the shooting look and, 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 and the shooting doesn't have the precision of the shooting of limelight, for instance. Uh, because he's in a hurry, because he's worried about money. Uh, and that was just a function of, of changing times. And cha the times were changing in ways that did not play to his strengths. And also, he's getting older. Let's face it, he's, he's in his, when he comes to make King of New York, he's pushing 70 years old. And 70 is kind of a, a, a breaking point for directors. There are very few directors that make good movies in their eighth decade. It's, it, I can think of one. I could, John Huston, I think made a great movie in his in, at 80. Kurosawa made some good movies in his 70s, but there aren't a huge number of, of, uh, of directors who do. Generally, that's when the director begins to fall off. And Chaplin falls, falls off as well. One more movie. Brando, Chaplin, do they go together? The book no. is Charlie Chaplin versus America. When art, sex, and politics collided, Scott Iman is the author. Charlie's now living in Switzerland at a house called Manoir. His children are growing. Una is a heroine of heroines, very stable life. She found Charlie the stability that she needed because of her unacceptable father, Eugene O'Neill. But at the same time, Charlie was, as Scott tells us, not fully engaged the way he had been in Los Angeles or New York. He has one more movie to make. It's about a script that could have been a comedy and could have been successful back in the 1930s, could have been. But for, for reasons that I cannot recover, Marlon Brando shows up as a hero. How did that happen, Scott? The film was financed by Universal, uh, and they had Brando under contract. And Chaplin originally had written the script in the 1930s for Gary Cooper and Paula Goddard. And if you recast the picture with Gary Cooper and Paul Goddard in the 1930s, it might have worked. Uh, in, but it's 1966, and, Cha and Universal has agreed to finance the picture generously, I might say. Uh, and they got Brando under contract. Chaplin wanted Sean Connery to play the part because he, uh, uh, he liked the way Connery played James Bond. Uh, but Universal didn't see any reason why they should pay Ch Sean Connery when they were already paying Marlon Brando. So Brando agreed, because he liked Chaplin's films, Brando agreed to uh, blow off one of his uh, 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 films he had to make for Universal with the Chaplin picture. Well, they didn't, Chaplin was a hands-on director, literally a hands-on director. He would grab an actor and move them into position. You know, he was very physical. And, and Brando, A, is not a comedian uh, at all. He's a dramatic actor and uh, uh, he was unhappy and Chaplin was unhappy with him and they didn't really speak much off camera. They were, and there was never anything overt. They never had angry words, particularly after the first day. The uh, Ch Brando didn't show up for the first day or two. And when he finally did show up, Chaplin confronted him and said, you're working for Charlie Chaplin now, you son of a bitch. If you don't want to be here, take the next train back. Uh, and Brando backed down, and he was perfectly uh, polite for the rest of the picture, but there was no communication between the two of them. Whereas Chaplin and Sophia Loren, who was the leading lady, got along gorgeously, and he loved Loren, and Loren loved him, and she loved working with him. Uh, but Brando is simply the wrong actor for the part, which uh, if Chaplin had been paying attention and watched some Brando movies, he would have known. <laughs> I had a hard time Brando's putting Brando... 
Sophia Loren and Brando were hard for me to be on the same set, for heaven's sakes. That's a tough one. And Tippi Hedren was on as well as the Tippi wife? Too. She was playing Brando's wife, yes, yes. Uh, and she had a great time. She enjoyed it. And I, I, I mean, I did talk to Loren, Brando's dead, but I did talk to Tippi. And, and she was very uh, articulate about the film. There was never, a, there, it never broke out of the open. There was never any yelling on the set, but you could tell that it was, and Brando was professional, but that's all, you know? He would show up, he'd do the scenes as Chaplin wanted him to do the scenes. He'd say the lines as Chaplin wanted him to say the lines, but he's not projecting anything. He's not putting any effort into it. He's kind of walking through it. And it's a part that Cary Grant could have played, but Cary Grant was in the process of retiring. David Niven could have played it, but I don't know that Universal would have financed it. And it's a short list of people that could have played it, naturally. Uh, Gary Cooper's dead. Uh, so the Brando kind of derailed the project. And frankly, it doesn't have any energy. It's, 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 it's a, it, as I write in the book, it's a shipboard, ro shipboard romance written in the 1930s, put out in a year when the big films were The Graduate and Bonnie and Clyde. Well, <laughs> there's nothing, there's only so much you can do when uh, uh, the public and professional tide turns that radically against a shipboard romance. You know, it wasn't the year for a shipboard romance. Let's put it that way. It was that plot, though. Rescue a woman. It Again, was yes. yes. Again, yes. It's a, it's a woman in need of rescue who has to be rescued if she's not to, you know, come to a catastrophe. Same and way. if I had to choose, I would want to be rescued by Sean Connery, not by Marlon Brando. I think Sean Connery would be more effective <laughs> at rescuing a woman than, Sean, than Bar Marlon Brando would be. Because the clip that I saw of the movie, Brando is almost not in this. He's, he doesn't want to be there. You, he, he's mechanical, uh, unlike any t anything I've ever seen him. You know, he does that emote thing where he moves funny. He yeah. didn't do it here. Brando yeah, right. mechanical, is is good way think. mechanical is a good way to put it. Mechanical is a good way to put it. He's there, but not there. Finally, I want to celebrate Sid. Uh, Charlie Chaplin gets a great deal of attention. He should. He's a genius. But Sid is the father and mother that Charlie Chaplin never had. And he lives on, I love the way he always appears in your book, living on the, on the Riviera or some other climb, having a good time. And Charlie never writes him because he's afraid of, that he can't spell is his excuse. Right, he, right. He right. always wants to hear from Charlie. Sid lived out his life happily in Europe on the money. Is that correct? Sid was the designated rogue of Charlie's life. He was irresponsible. He was, uh, he made Charlie's relationships with women look benign. Uh, uh, Sid was a volatile character to say the least. He spent a great deal of time trying to avoid taxes wherever he was, whether he was living in, in the South of France or, 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 or in London or in America. He was all about it, but he was a nudist. I, Sid was just a fabulous character, uh, unless you were married to him. The, 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 but Charlie, he was he was the rock of Charlie's life. He was always there if Charlie needed him. He was there if Charlie didn't need him. Uh, and Charlie, there are some wonderful letters where Charlie basically, Sid, I need you, come, come running. And Sid would always come running because Sid was the older brother who had taken responsibility for Charlie when they were children and young adults and he had it was inculcated in him and he never got over the fact that charlie uh would need rescuing you know even when after after a certain point charlie didn't need rescuing if charlie could take on the united states government and the entire internal security apparatus of america and survive uh he didn't need sid anymore but sid was always there and charlie always uh if he didn't always write letters, he always loved Sid. And he always did his best to uh, take care of Sid in a way that Sid, although Sid could take care of himself. The book is Charlie Chaplin versus America. Scott Iman is the author. I'm John Batchelor.